know, we just heard about, we just heard about joy and hope. And I'm going to tell you a story about it, the old Jewish telegram. You know the story? You know, there is the Jewish telegram back in the old days when they didn't have text or WhatsApp that says, start worrying, letter to follow. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it doesn't go well with my sunny personality to be a prophet of doom. But I have to admit that I am worried. Uh, more precisely, I'm, I'm actually torn between how much to worry. How, what is the level of worry that is the right one? Now, as we look at the problems that the Jewish people and Israel face today, we may take a page from Ari Wallach's book and look at the long term. We will see that for Jews, or at least for Jewish states, the number 75 has been historically catastrophic. In fact, the two Jewish previous experiences in statehood collapsed after a mere 75 years. In our first state, 3,000 years ago, David and Solomon had a united kingdom. They could hold it together for 75 years. After that, the kingdom split and decadence ensued. A few hundred years after that, the Hasmoneans established a kingdom after the story of Hanukkah, the Maccabee revolt, also lasted for 75 years, then it collapsed in civil war and the Romans occupied the country. In both cases, the country was strong and prosperous and in fact, it was at the peak of its power. And in both cases, the collapse was triggered by internal conflict. You obviously know where I'm going with this. Israel is now at 75. On the one hand, it's at its peak of its military and economic power. Its achievements fill us with joy and with pride. And yet, the threat of dissolution and civil strife is felt more keenly than ever. I know that history doesn't repeat itself, and I know that Israel is a strong and resilient country, but when the president of the state calls this the biggest crisis in the history of the country and repeats over and over that he fears a civil war, we must pay attention. Maybe worrying now can save us from lamenting later. Maybe being a little catastrophist is the way to avoid real catastrophe in the future. So can, how can history serve us as a cautionary tale? Can we make sure that third time is a charm and this time we get statehood right? And what can we do as funders and leaders? We'll get to that in a moment, but first, to understand the problem that we and Israel face today, we need to go back to the sources, to the father of modern Zionism. Theodore Herzl not only prophesied the creation of the state, but he foresaw the double challenge that Israel and the Jewish people are facing today. He wrote two seminal books that were supposed to be both intention and complementary to each other. His first book, The Jewish State, The Judenstadt, was all about anti-Semitism and how to respond to it. He wrote, we have tried to integrate to the countries in which we live, seeking only to preserve our faith. They didn't let us. In vain, we are loyal patriots, sometimes super loyal. In vain, we made enormous sacrifice of life and property for our country. In vain, we strive to enhance the fame of our native lands in the arts and science, in commerce and trade, and yet, we are still decried as aliens. And then he proposes his solution. I consider the Jewish question, he says, to be a national question. The land of Israel is our historic homeland. The Jews who will it shall achieve their state, and we shall, we shall live at last as free men in our own soil. Jews, continued Herzl, must depend on themselves and not in the whimsical mercy of others. In other words, for Herzl, the only solution to anti-Semitism for Jews to survive, we need to have an, our own state in our own homeland, and that state needs to be strong and powerful so as to defend itself and make sure that Jews are safe everywhere in the world. But a few years later, Herzl wrote a second book, 
Alf Neuland, Old New Land. Curiously, in that book, there is no mention of anti-Semitism at all. The book deals exclusively with the character of the state. As Herzl was prophetic about the creation of the state and the tragedy if it's not created, he also foresaw the conflict that Israel is having today. In a key part of the book, there is a confrontation between Rabbi Geyer, a man who's running for office, who wants to deprive Arabs of civil rights and convert Israel into a theocratic dictatorship, and Dr. Marcus, what we will call today a liberal Democrat, who wants to keep Israel enlightened, humanist, and democratic. Herzl fears that if Geyer gets to implement his program, the Jewish state, as he imagined it, will be in grave danger. He understood that the Jewish state can't be just any state, that is very survival dependent on its character and its values. He knew that the state will require enormous sacrifices, and those sacrifices will only be borne by a people that has full freedom and can be fully proud of what it's building. Herzl and successive leaders like Ben-Gurion and Begin understood that democracy wasn't a mere add-on to the Jewish state, but a condition for its very existence. Now, the question is not who is Geyer and who is Marcus in the current debate. That is up to you to decide. The point is that there is a clash about the nature and the character of the country, a clash that could, God forbid, turn violent. So today, we face the two challenges that Herzl saw and foresaw. On the other hand, we face the specter of a resurgent anti-Semitism on college campuses, in white supremacy, in bigots that badly hide their anti-Semitism as anti-Zionism. Not since World War II has anti-Semitism been legitimized by those in power. Not since World War II has anti-Semitism been part of police discourse and intellectual debate or reach even the boardrooms of the corporate world. And at the same time, the struggle anticipated by Herzl inside the Jewish state is happening in front of our eyes. We live now in the scenario of Alt Neuland, a moment of truth in which the character and the nature of the state is being decided. And both the result of that decision and the dysfunctional way in which we're fighting for it will mark Israel for generations to come. So what should we funders do in this critical moment? What should be our role? Let me, fear, let me share a few thoughts with you. One, this engagement is not an option. Some among us, some among us are calling to disengage from Israel. Some because they are disappointed and some because they think it's none of our business. To those that are disappointed, I lovingly say this. Israel is not a consumer good that you discard when it disappoints you. It's not a card that you throw away when a new model comes along. It's part of us. It's part of you. And you don't disengage from a part of you. You don't leave your family when the, when the going gets rough. Rather, the opposite. You engage more. You invest more. You get more involved. Israelis are not giving up. On both sides of the debate, they are fighting for the future of the country, and they need your support. Who are we to give up? if they don't. To those that say it's Israel's internal business, I lovingly say this. While it's true that the main actors in the drama of Israel are the Israelis themselves, what happens there affects us all, because Israel is the only true collective project of the Jewish people. We support Israel unconditionally, and part of that support is making it the best place it can be, even if we disagree on what that means. Organizations that work towards addressing social issues in Israel can be avenues for engagement. So instead of telling young people to give up on Israel, we need to tell them that if you don't like what's going on there, go and change it. For funders being engaged, is not just talk or write angry things like I sometimes do when I can't control myself. Funders, above all, fund and lead 
And today, there are tons of things that we can and must fund in Israel. Second, don't ascribe to the game of the anti-Semites. You see, anti-Semites and anti-Zionists hate the good things of Israel, not the bad ones. They didn't need Ben Gvir to demonize Israel and call for our demise. Don't fall for that trick. BDS wasn't launched as a response to the judicial reform. In fact, it was launched during governments of the left. So today, we need to redouble, retriple our efforts to fight anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. We need to be very clear-eyed that whatever the failing of our state, its right to exist cannot be put in question. We need to fight relentlessly those that hijack the language of human rights to call for bigotry against us. It may sound contradictory, but it isn't. Actually, the opposite. Fighting for the character of the state should give us the moral high ground to redouble our efforts to defend Israel in the public square. The challenge of anti-Semitism requires creative solutions, extensive bridge building, and above all, a willingness to fight and not to give up. That's why in this conference, we had many sessions on anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, and that's why I encourage you all to join the many efforts that defend Jews and Israel in the public square. Three, funders can be the adults in the room. Funders can exert influence, and wherever we stand politically, we can all call for moderation, compromise, and rationality. The degradation of public discourse in Israel is rampant, and nobody seems to be acting responsibly. Nothing good can come from that. The last time that Jews were called Nazis by other Jews, blood was spilled. As Hillel said, when there is no person, be a person. That may be our task as funders be the voice of reason, calm, and public responsibility. We need to model public discourse even when, and precisely when, the tempers are hot and the stakes are high. But lower, lowering the temperature doesn't mean tampering dissent. On the contrary, funders need to protect the right of people to say what they think. We live in a time in which debate is suppressed and discourse that doesn't ascribe to a certain dogma gets penalized or canceled. There is no way to build a healthy and vibrant community. Four, funders will need to heal the wounds and keep the dialogue open. I always say that today the main difference in the Jewish people is not right and left, secular and religious, but between those that accept the diversity and plurality of the Jewish people and those that don't. In all camps, we have people that would love to have a Jewish people that look exactly like them, that th thinks exactly like them. Well, we are who we are, diverse, fractious, plural, and we all have the same intrinsic value. This crisis, this crisis will be over, and when that happens, we funders will need to help pick up the pieces and rebuild the fabric of civic life. While many of our members have strong opinions about the current situation, Jeff and Israel has brought together people of different persuasions to continue the dialogue, to find ways to disagree civilly, lovingly, and respectfully, to try with empathy to understand the point of view of the other. We obviously can't count on politicians to do it. Many Jeff and funders know that funding coexistence and dialogue is not kumbaya, but using our philanthropic power to help people tackle the very real and hard challenges of living together in a shared society. And five, when the meaning of Judaism and Zionism is debated internally and vilified externally, we need to give our community, and especially our young, the knowledge and the tools to be part of the conversation. For that, we need to invest much more in Jewish and Zionist education. We can't let our young learn Zionism by listening to the toxic and polarized debates of today. We can't let Jews learn what Judaism means from anti-Semites. We can't let college students learn about Zionism from BDS. And we can't allow extremists on the left and the right to sell us on a twisted version of Judaism that suits their political agendas. 
we can't give extremists and anti-Semites the right to define Judaism and Zionism for us. How many in the American Jewish community read the books that I mentioned before? How many know of the works of Rav Kook or Jabotinsky or Borokhov? And because the brain abhors a vacuum, when we don't know our own history, we end up absorbing the biases of others. We can't allow what Herzl feared the most. By absorbing the disdain of others, he feared, we'll end up despising ourselves. These are just five general directions I suggest. And I'm sure you can think of others. This is, after all, a room full of people that imagine the impossible and make it happen. You are the dreamers, the doers, and you are philanthropists, as Marcia said yesterday, because you believe that change is possible, that the future doesn't necessarily need to be like the past. So my main message today is this. We are the blessed generation, the one that could see the miracle of Israel reborn. Because we got that incomprehensible blessing, it's incumbent upon us to help prove history wrong, to defy the odds, to make third times a charm, and make sure that 75 becomes our lucky number. Our challenge today is to hold the two Herzl books simultaneously, fight tooth and nail against the external threats and the people that seek to demonize us and destroy us. And on the other hand, conduct the necessary debate about the nature of our, natural, of our national renaissance. As tough as this debate is, it's our debate and we can't avoid it. And we, funders and leaders, can and must influence that debate. While we fight for the Israel we want, we need to ensure that we don't fracture our people beyond repair. Herzl II book, The Jewish and the Democratic Dimensions of Our National Project, are reflected in the document that gave birth to Israel. From our foundation, we knew the double challenge that we had. So we engraved it in the birth certificate of our nation, the Declaration of Independence. For me, this document is highly personal. Growing up, I had it affixed to my wall above my bed, and I read it every night as a secular prayer for the place that was the center of my yearnings. So much that to this very day, I know the text by heart. You can see that's my childhood room there. A very Zionist kid I was. Now it's a sign of the craziness of our time that now many consider these words to be subversive and other consider them colonialist. But for me, they are the most beautiful words ever written by a human hand, for they crystallize the highest aspirations and the inalienable rights of our people. And because they aren't any words that I can come up with that will be more powerful and more beautiful than this, I will finish my remarks with them. Zoe is chuto ativit shel ha'am ha'yehudi, liot kechol am be'am, omed birshut hatzmo bimdinato haribonit. This right is the natural right of the Jewish people, to be masters of their own right, to be like all other nations in their sovereign state. Accordingly, we, members of the People's Council, representative of the Jewish community of Eretz Israel and of the Zionist movement, are here assembled on the day of the termination of the British mandate over Eretz Israel and by virtue of our natural and historic right and on the strength of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel, the State of Israel. The State of Israel will be open to Jewish immigration and to the ingathering of exiles. It will foster the development of the country for the benefits of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions, and it will be faithful to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. We appeal to the Arab inhabitants of the State of Israel to preserve the peace and participate in the upbuilding of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship, 
and do representation in all its institutions. We extend our hand to all neighboring states and their peoples in an offer of, good, of peace and good neighborliness. And we appeal to them to establish bonds of cooperation and mutual help with the sovereign Jewish state. The state of Israel is prepared to do its share in a common effort for the advancement of the entire Middle East. We appeal to the Jewish people throughout the diaspora to rally around the Jews of Eretz Israel in the task of immigration and rebuilding and to stand by them in the great struggle for the realization of the age-old dream, the redemption of Israel. Placing our trust in the Almighty, we affix our signature to this proclamation at the session of the Provisional Council of State on the soil of the homeland in the city of Tel Aviv on the Shabbat Eve, the 5th of year, 5708, the 14th of May, 1948.